today. Why this could be the last chance to see these beautiful creatures. I'll be having a scary go at the unusual sport of kite buggying. I'll be trying my hand at inventing a delicious new chocolate bar. And how the most famous sign in the history of the world came to be on a hillside in Hollywood. But first, here's Sally in the chocolate capital of Britain. The world's best-selling chocolate bar is so popular that 400 of them are eaten every second. And 6 million of them are produced here at this chocolate factory every single day. But before you become a wonder bar, how'd you get started? Here's the scoop. The Nestle Chocolate Factory in York has the biggest team of international chocolate experts in the world who are constantly coming up with brand new ideas. And it all starts in the product development room. Because the competition between the different chocolate companies is so great, this room here is incredibly top secret. And we're only allowed to come in here as long as we don't show any of the new chocolate bars. Brian Solit was one of the chocolate designers that invented After Eights. Hey, look at this, the guru at work. Now, Brian is what's affectionately known as a chocolate basher. And it's your job to design lots of new bars of chocolate. That's correct. Now, because I can never decide on what type of chocolate I like the best, I set Brian the task of making a very special bar that combines dark, white, milk and orange chocolate. Mold. Oh, bossy, right. Uh, take a piping bag. OK. And start Squeeze piping. some chocolate into the impressions. Now, if you go to that tin there, with your mould, no, take your mould to the tin. Pushing me around, no wonder you call it chocolate basher. Right, Turn it upside this? down. Like this? Up, right over. Like that? That way up, that way up, that way up, into the coal cabinet. That way up. Into here, keep out top secret. No, you can, you're not allowed to look in there. Oh. In that side. Oh, I just did. Ha, <laughs> you didn't see that. Right, here we go, in there? Yep. OK, there you go, it's in there. Now, Once it had cooled, it was time to put in the special orange, dark milk and white fillings that Brian had created. Then seal them in with the last bit of chocolate. The finished bar looked fantastic and was completely original. That certainly very different. I've never seen one like that before. Very unique. Well, that's the finished bar. Now it's time to taste it. Well, I think the best job in the world has got to be a chocolate taster. I mean, these people can describe chocolate like a connoisseur can describe wine. And in this little booth here, we have Julie. Bonjour. Hello. Why are you inside the booth, Julie? I'm tasting some chocolate. And Julie trained for years to eat chocolate all day. And perhaps because she's French, she has a unique insight into chocoholics from around the world. For instance, the milk chocolate is much more for British people. And dark chocolate is much more for French people. We like dark chocolate. It's one thing to have made the perfect chocolate bar, but what about the perfect wrapper? I think the Sally bar's got a ring to it. Long, slender fingers covered in chocolate, most of the time anyway, and a soft centre. But it looks like the producers got there first, the scoop bar. That's original, not. I like the design though, but will it be the next big thing in Chocolatesville? Well, there's only one way to find out. Over here. Now, excuse me, you look as if you've got a good taste bud. I have got very good Would you like to try our new bar and tell me what you think? Do you like chocolate? I do, not with nuts in love. It's OK, it's quite nice. It's called Scoop Bar. What flavour is that you've got? Chocolate. chocolate. What do you think of that? Nice and milky. It's quite nice, actually. That's Did a bit it? orangey. There's milk chocolate. It's not too sickly. White chocolate. All in one bar as well, eh? Dark chocolate. It's different though, me, though. I'm not nice. I like it. No, you can't. You can give that one back. I've got to go and try it out with other people. That's okay, fine. Thank you, cut there. Here you get a fantastic view of Los Angeles. Below the Hollywood Bowl, in the smoggy distance it's downtown LA, in front of that the Hollywood Freeway, across here we've got the Santa Ana Mountains and finally the most famous landmark of all, the Hollywood sign. But did you know it was originally put on that hillside as an advertising gimmick for a housing development? Here's the scoop. The sign was put up in 1923 by a firm of estate agents called Hollywood Land Realty. They'd just built a new housing development called Hollywood Land, and that's what the sign originally read. But a few years later, there was a terrible disaster. A mudslide came crashing down the hill, knocking over the letters L, A, N and D. So the sign was left reading Hollywood. But if the mudslide had have been in a slightly different position, we might talk today about woodland movies, woodland stars, and that famous song, Hurry for Woodland. <laughs> 
do 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 woodland. No. <laughs> the signs had a checkered history. Legend has it that one actress whose career had taken a turn for the worse climbed to the top of the letter H and threw herself off to plummet to her death 100 feet below. It's said that she chose the letter H because it was the easiest to climb. By the 70s, the sign was starting to look a bit tatty. The scaffolding was rusting and the authorities were threatening to pull it down. No way, said the Hollywood stars. Save our sign. So the big names banded together and coughed up the money to rebuild the sign in steel at $27,000 per letter. Rock star Alice Cooper paid for the last O and the Y is dedicated to Hugh Hefner, the publisher of Playboy magazine. Each letter stands 17 metres tall and is coated with special paint to stop graffiti artists leaving their mark. The strange thing is, you can catch glimpses of the sign from all over town, but you can't actually get to it. It's in a park called Griffith Park, but there are no paths up to it. In fact, it's surrounded by a high-tech security system that alerts the park officials if anyone even attempts the climb. So that's the scoop on the most famous advertising sign in the world. Next time you see a Hollywood blockbuster, remember, but for a well-placed mudslide, you could be settling down to a woodland movie. And now for this week's true scoop. On jeans, we've all got at least one pair. But did you know that every time you pull on your denims, you're paying tribute to a Bavarian refugee who landed in San Francisco during the gold rush of the 1850s? Here's the scoop. Levi Strauss was 24 when he arrived in America. He struck his gold when he cottoned onto the idea of making special hard-wearing trousers and selling them to the prospectors. Levi invented a new kind of dungarees with no bibs at the front. He gave them copper rivets for strength and called them waist overalls. Catchy name. The term jeans wasn't coined until the 1960s. It's probably short for Genoese, which refers to a type of sailor's trousers produced in Genoa in Italy. The name denim comes from Nîmes in France, where Levi got his heavy duty serge fabric from. From Nîmes, de Nîmes, denim, get it? More riveting stuff. Jeans used to have rivets in back pockets, but these were removed in the 1930s thanks to teachers. Even back in those days, American kids wore jeans to school. But the back rivets scored the classroom seat so badly that the nation's headmasters asked them to be removed. But apart from minor details like belt loops and back rivets, the classic jean look has stayed much the same since they were first invented 140 years ago. Now that's what I call long-lasting style.